So, aloha, everybody, and welcome to the eighth installment of the POD podcast, or the Pythagorean Order of Death podcast, um, available everywhere that I choose to post it. Um, today's installment is going to be uh, the second of uh, a different type than the usual uh, AMA standard format uh, of the Ask Me Anything questions usually being submitted by Andrus Lux. And I'm going to uh, return to the format I had followed once before with Pedro Marcus and uh, answer some direct questions on a single topic uh, posed to me by Andrew Jones uh Canadian friend of mine but try not to hold uh his can being Canadian against him uh still a good fellow um wonderful person full of uh exuberant desire to learn more about life and its meanings so without further ado I'll drop right into his questions which are on the subject of Theosophy. Andrew writes, Blavatsky was an enigmatic and charismatic figure in the 1800s who massively made an impact on the Western esoteric tradition and New Age spirituality. There's no doubt she was a storehouse of information, but the veracity of her claims may be tenuous. What do you think Blavatsky's most veritable information and commentary was? And then opposite of that, what do you think she may have been dishonest about? And I reply. Firstly, if we're gauging the veracity of Blavatsky's claims by modern materialist scientific standards, then the entirety of theosophy is technically fiction and can only be examined by light of religious belief. In other words, we're not likely to find archaeological or anthropological evidence to support her claim that during the fourth root race, living in Atlantis, higher beings descended and bred with and bred giants who mated with she animals to sire gorillas and chimpanzees. These claims derive from ancient myths, Genesis 6, and should not be seen as comparable in any way to contemporary and modern sciences, such as evolutionary biology and genetics. In this context, everything Blavatsky ever said would be seen as being purely pseudoscience, which should also go a long way toward discrediting the racist eugenics philosophies it inspired. That being said, Blavatsky almost certainly had an eidetic or photographic memory that allowed her to nearly accurately quote, albeit without attribution to their sources, around a hundred other books without acknowledgement, in Isis Unveiled alone. So she was, as you put it, definitely a storehouse of information. However, she devoted almost all of her personal mental energy to imagining a synthesis combining all the myths from ancient cultures that is almost entirely original and not actually supported by the later excavated myths these cultures preserved. Although it was named such in the 1970s, I'd attribute the origins of the modern New Age movement entirely to the syncretic efforts of H.P.B. and Albert Pike during the 1800s, without whom the works of Zachariah Sitchin and other ancient aliens researchers today would likely have far less traction in global sociocultural trends. The real problem with finding physical evidence to demonstrate the actual facticity of such syncretism of religious beliefs from ancient cultures, 
especially basing it on modern knowledge of their original myths, is that the original myths themselves were fictions. So any attempt to combine them all into a single monomyth, whether by HPB or later mythologists like Joseph Campbell, let alone moderns like Michael Witzel, amounts to a novel fiction, amounts only to a novel fiction, with little or no basis in material reality at all. Certainly, ancient people no more believed in Blavatsky's root races or seven rays ideas than they did in Sitchin's Lost Book of Enki, because both of these result from modern people looking back at ancient myths through the biased lens of syncretism, that is, from a perspective looking at the present as the historical foundation of a globalist New Age religion. Andrew's second point and question. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn seemed to be one of the most impactful mystery schools of the late 1800s and early 1900s, where do you see similarities, but most interestingly, the differences between the two schools of thought, the HOGD and theosophy, in cosmology and in praxis? And I replied, although the Bund movement that grew among later members of Golden Dawn Lodges, eventually culminating in Crowley's reform of the OTO, and its publication of the Equinox, whose famous motto was, we place no reliance on virgin nor pigeon, our method is science, our aim is religion, did advocate a globalization of groups that required a multicultural syncretism of ancient myths. The cipher manuscripts upon which the Golden Dawn was originally based provide only a degree system of rituals and knowledge lectures, and in such provide no original mythological cosmology, unlike HPB. The cipher manuscripts themselves are based largely on the principles underlying the contemporary Societas Rosicrucianae in Anglia, an appendant Trinitarian Freemasonic body formed by Robert Wentworth Little in 1865. Because Freemasonry of the era promoted religious syncretism, particularly in terms of combining the then-known myths of ancient cultures, both in America with Albert Pike's 1871 Morals and Dogma, and in Europe with the emulation ritual merging the English ancients with the continental moderns, having been established only as recently as 1813 with the formation of the United Grand Lodge of England. It is highly likely that Henry Steele Alcott, 1832 to 1907, HPB's lifelong companion and renowned Freemason, and Robert Wentworth Little, 1840 to 1878, renowned Freemason and founder of the SRIA, spiritual progenitor of the Golden Dawn, shared this vision of a new age global religion. While the Golden Dawn degree system, adopted by Crowley in his reformed OTO, establishes a framework for the promotion of theological scholars in this new age religious school, or, in other words, a method of rank and hierarchy for a New Age church, Blavatsky's theosophy provides the essential religious philosophy and beliefs meant to be espoused by this church. Of course, relations between Crowley's OTO and Blavatsky's Theosophical Society have always been awkward, as they promote very different moralities. Crowley's inherent hedonism being almost 180 degree opposite, Blavatsky's advocacy of sexual celibacy. In short, the Golden Dawn as a New Age religious order and the theosophy of HPB being the New Age religious doctrine of this cult 
were, I believe, intended to, to complement one another by design of certain Freemason social engineers of the period. So it may be said that the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn had no specific religion attached to it, and so it may be said that the Theosophical Society had no specific initiatory hierarchy attached to it, because these two were ultimately meant to combine into a single New Age religion. Andrew's third question. We cannot forget to bring up the influence Blavatsky had on Crowley's development. Where do you see major disconnects between the Theosophical Society's cosmology and the cosmology of Thelema? Firstly, in dealing with Theosophy and Thelema, we must note both are originally trans-channeled myths that purportedly expound upon certain ancient documents. In the case of HPB, this was the Stanzas of Jayan documents, written in pre-Sanskrit Senzar language, and supposedly part of the Gui D section of Tantras in Buddhist scriptures. In the case of Crowley, this was the Steli of Revealing, exhibit number 666 in the Bullock Cairo Museum. Both authors claim to be receiving their revealed claims from another supernatural form of source as well. Blavatsky recorded about writing Isis Unveiled, the presence of the lodger who is in me as an inspirational muse responsible for dictating most of this work. This is, of course, in addition to her claims about the masters of the ancient wisdom or ascended masters, su such as Moria, Hilarion, Serapis Bay, and Kutumi, or telepathic teachers who chose to incarnate and who were then congregated in Tibet. Crowley, likewise, described Iwas as the dictator of his interpretation of the steli of revealing into his Book of the Law or Liber Legis, later associating this discarnate being with his own holy guardian angel in the equinox of the gods, as a minister of Horpakrat, Greek Harpocrates, in A.L. Book 1, verse 7, as the voice of the eighth ether in Liber 418, Crowley's vision and the voice, Blue Equinox, and ultimately with the devil in magic and theory and practice. As such, the cosmologies between these two authors, as such, the cosmologies these two authors described were vastly different. In the Secret Doctrine's twin volumes, one, Cosmogenesis, and two, Anthropogenesis, HPB describes her concept of the current cosmos as Maya, a temporary illusion, and as an expression of the primordial force of Fohat, emanated as the seven rays called the Diane Kohans, HPB claimed that every solar system is an expression of a logos or solar deity, and that within each of these were seven ministers or planetary spirits, such that each planet to form has a sevenfold constitution, known as the planetary chains, wherein the planet's physical globe overlaps in the same space with two astral bodies two mental bodies, and two spiritual bodies. According to HPB, evolution occurred along a descending and then ascending arc from one end of these chains to the other, and stated that this took the form of phases of evolution of matter on the planet, from mineral onto vegetable, 
animal, human, and then to superhuman, and that these occurred on multiple planets successively, such that when the era of mineral evolution on one planet ended, it would begin on the next, and so forth. The result of this spiritual evolution here on Earth were, as described extensively in Secret Doctrine Volume 2, the seven root races, each of which was divided into seven sub-races. She described the first root race as living in the imperishable sacred land, and the second, the Hyperboreans, as living near the North Pole. The third root race lived in Lemuria, modern Australia, and the fourth in Atlantis, where they had psychic powers and advanced technology given to them by higher beings who descended to the planet and bred giants who raised Stonehenge, as well as modern gorillas and chimpanzees by mating with the she-animals of this era. She called the fifth root race the Aryans and claimed the sixth root race would be heralded by the coming of Maitreya, a messianic figure from Mahayana Buddhism. <clears throat> in Crowley's Liber Legus, we are introduced to his interpretation of the ancient Egyptian goddess of the night sky, Nut, which Crowley called Nuit, associated with limitly vast space, and of the solar disk god, Heru Betiti, called in Greek Hadith, which Crowley called Hadith, and associated with an infinitesimally finite amount of space. These twin deities consummate and yield a third, called Heru Raha, whose active aspect is called Ra Hor Kuit and whose passive aspect is called Hor-Pa-Krat, dubbed in Crowley's texts, the crowned and conquering child. In the introduction to Liber Legis, Crowley notes that these three prime deities, one of these is in charge of notes about these three prime deities. One of these is in charge of the destinies of this planet for periods of 2,000 years and adds, the moment of change from one period to another is technically called the equinox of the gods. He further, he further identifies Nuit with Isis, Hadit with Osiris, and Heru-Raha with Horus and associates the era of Osiris as beginning 500 BC. In later works, Crowley also described the goddess Babylon, a virgin whore and scarlet woman, as well as two Megatherion, the great beast, on which Babylon rides. Although he imagined dozens of new deities, including Koran's own, the demon of dispersion, that appear in the Night of Pan, N-O-X, in the City of the Pyramids, as described in his Vision and the Voice Blue Equinox writings. Andrew's next question and comment. Blavatsky spoke at length warning of black magic and it being more or less manipulation where Crowley simply said any magical act not performed to the attainment of one's true will is black magic, and obviously taught at length on Goetia. I'd love to hear some elaboration on those differences. So my reply is this. Blavatsky certainly warned against faked spiritism, a form of spiritualism that incorporated belief in reincarnation and stated of spiritualism generally that the entities being contacted by spiritualist mediums were not the spirits of the dead, but instead either mischievous elementals or the shells left behind by the deceased. 
Nevertheless, she did promote both spiritualist and spiritist beliefs in her texts and in her own practice of manifesting spirit phenomenon. As a, as a result of this, in December 1885, the Society for Psychical Research, SPR, accused HPB of being guilty for committing all the same frauds of which she had accused her competitors, although in 1986, this report was officially retracted. Likewise, Crowley, con Crowley cautioned against the Black Brothers, who were ever pit against the so-called Great White Brotherhood of the Ascended Masters. Crowley, like Blavatsky, believed in the perennial tradition of Western esoteric mysticism, However, he believed the ascended Mahatmas she had described were specifically a lineage of ceremonial magicians, some who could manifest their own bodies and appear out of thin air at will. In opposition to these ascended masters were those who practiced the left-hand path of black magic and sought only destruction. Nevertheless, Crowley sued Mathers in court for the right to publish the Goetia, or Lesser Key of King Solomon Grimoire, which is historically a work of black magic, and to which, in appendices, Crowley addends a few curses in Enochian of his own. It cannot be doubted Crowley was, himself, a practitioner of ceremonial magic rituals that would have been considered immoral by the societal standards of his time. So to consider him a hypocrite for practicing the opposite of what he preached should hardly be worth adding to his list of sins. Andrew's next point. End question. Especially with the Nag Hammadi Library being released around the same time as Crowley's death. Any speculation on Gnostic material prior to the finding of the Nag Hammadi Library with respect to major occult figures having access to some of these works? So my reply is, there were only a few authentically Gnostic scriptures known of prior to 1945 when the Nag Hammadi Library was unearthed in Chenoboski in Egypt. But there may be little way to determine if these texts were actually ever in the possession of the aforementioned major occult figures. For example, the Bruce Codex, containing the Books of Jew and the Untitled Text, was discovered in 1769 and had, by 1933, been translated into English by Charlotte A. Baines. The Askew Codex, found in 1772, contained the Gnostic Pistis Sophia in Coptic, and the Berlin Codex, found in 1896, contained the Gospel of Mary, the Apocryphon of John, the Pistis Sophia, or Sophia of Jesus Christ, and the brief Act of Peter, this last text being translated first by German Coptologist Karl Schmidt in 1903. Additionally, some Hermetica, including the 17 Corpus Hermeticum documents with the Divine Pymander and the Asclepius Treatise, had been translated into Latin in 1471, however had excluded the Hermetic Discourse on the 8th and the 9th that was discovered in the Nag Hammadi. Besides these, many of the Greek magical papyri contents were in circulation from the 1700s onward and began appearing in English translation from 1853. Karl stats. Carl Preisendans, rather, collected the work, collected the texts, and published them in two volumes in 1928 and 1931. 
there has been some speculation comparing the headless right in PGM volume 5 verses 96 through 172 to the bornless ritual of the golden dawn adopted by Crowley as the preliminary invocation of the Goetia. Likewise, the Ethiopic Book of Enoch had been circulating in Europe from the 1400s in various manuscript forms, and in 1773, British explorer James Bruce retrieved three copies in Guise from his travels in Abyssinia that was translated first in part into Latin, then German in 1801, and into English by Richard Lawrence in 1821. Additionally, other apocryphal texts, such as Two Enoch or Slavonic Enoch, the fifth through eighth books of Maccabees, the sixth and seventh books of Moses, Grimoire, and others, such as the sworn book of Honorius of Thebes, were already widely circulated by this time. It is certain Crowley's passion for ancient texts was piqued by Mather's 1897 translation of The Sacred Magic of Abramelin, and it should not be overlooked, Crowley passed on in 1947, only two years following the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library Codexes in 1945, and one year following the first discovery of the Dead Sea or Qumran Cave Scrolls in 1946. So Andrew's next question and final in this podcast. Without trying to psychoanalyze these figures, Blavatsky and Crowley, how much of their upbringing played a part in their future in the esoteric? And my reply to that is, well, I can say that I have not read any biographies about Blavatsky, so I do not know much about her childhood directly, though I have read multiple biographies of Crowley, I in the Triangle by Rigardi and Perturabo by Kaczynski, as well as Crowley's own autobiography, The Confessions. It is certainly formative for young Blavatsky that her mother, writing under the pen name Genida Arve, Arva, R-V-A, Arva, translated Edward Bulwer Lytton from English to Russian, although these likely did not include the novel Vril, The Power of the Coming Race, which was first published anonymously in 1871. Likewise, it was undoubtedly formative for young Crowley that he was raised in the strict exclusive sect of the Plymouth Brethren community for the first 11 years of his life until his father died and that, according to him, his mother nicknamed him the Great Beast at a very young age. Both these occult luminaries rebelled against what they felt was authoritarian Christianity, Crowley adopting the moniker Two Megatherion as it totaled 666 in Greek gematria, and Blavatsky publishing the Lucifer magazine in London from 1887. Both had tumultuous love lives, Blavatsky being, at one point, a polygamist, simultaneously married to two men, but claiming to have remained a lifelong virgin. And Crowley's well-publicized bisexuality, with dozens of partners both during and between his two marriages, earning him being slandered as the wickedest man alive. Both were cremated following their deaths, and, if they'd ever met, I imagine both of them would have fought with each other. So those are Andrew's questions on theosophy and my hopefully brief answers on uh, some topics relating specifically to the lifetimes of Blavatsky and the uh, lifetime of Aleister Crowley following immediately thereafter. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up now. I hope you've all enjoyed tuning in. Um, uh, thanks for doing so. And, uh, hopefully I'll see you all next time. Uh, 
Um, have a good one. Peace.